Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Today we are continuing our meetings with outstanding guests, and today we have a Great Britain Ambassador to Russian Federation, Mr. Lawrence Stanley, who within uh, for, who will give the lecture for some 40 50 minutes in this historical hall where many leaders of different from different countries scientists politicians uh, take their floor it is the peculiarity of this room of this hall and i think that it will be uh, Good to give the floor to you, Mr. Ambassador. Please, you are welcome. If, you, if there are questions, please, you are free to ask them in Russian or in English, the way you like. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I am very glad to be here in Kazan, and I continue. I will continue in the English language as the. Uh, Rector said, well, so if you have the questions, please, you may ask them both in Russian or in English the way you like. Um, uh, Mr. Rector, um, uh, colleagues, thank you very much uh, for the invitation um, to visit you here um, in Kazan today. It's a huge pleasure um, to be present um, at this historic university, the Kazan Federal University, the University of Tolstoy, of Lenin, of Lobachevsky, of some of the great figures of Russian science, literature, mathematics, engineering, all of the things that the people in this room study. As British ambassador in Russia, um, my job is to talk quite a lot, but it's also to listen. Um, and one of the things that I have come here today to do is to listen. The people in this room represent the next generation um, of young Russians, the next generation of the people who my colleagues will be working with over the next 20, 30, 40 years. That makes this perhaps the most important meeting that I will have in Kazan today. So please, please tell me what you think um, through your questions, through your comments. What I'd like to say to do today is to talk a bit about how the United Kingdom and Russia work together. My background, all of my training is in politics, um, and we all know that the politics are very difficult at present. We shouldn't be embarrassed by that. There are real differences of opinion. There are real differences of view between Russia and the United Kingdom. We should talk about them. We should talk about them in a respectful and open way. And respect is a word that I come back to a lot uh, when talking with my Russian colleagues. If people want to ask me questions um, about politics, please do so, although please bear in mind um, that these are very, very sensitive subjects for everyone. Um, I'm very happy even to answer questions on Brexit, on our referendum and our future relationship with the European Union, if that would interest you. What I wanted to talk about today, though, is where we work together successfully, the ways in which the UK and Russia, UK and Tatarstan, can work together in the future. I've come to Kazan because Kazan is an education capital. It's an innovation capital, it's a sporting capital, and it's a business capital. The region consistently scores, scores highest in surveys of the investment climate in Russia. And Western companies come here. I've brought 27 companies from the UK uh, because they rate highly the quality of the people here, the young people here in particular. That means you. Um, you know, these companies are coming here because they want to work with you. So who are these companies? There are names like JCB. Um, they make um, construction equipment. Um, Cambridge University Press, they publish books. Um, British Airways, they transport people. I've also brought colleagues from Visit Britain um, who promote tourism and visits to the UK. I have a colleague from the British Council. The British Council's job is to develop education and culture links around the world 
Russia is one of the British Council's top three priorities in the world. I've also brought a team from my embassy, um, several of whom are responsible for organizing our arrangements for the World Cup um, in Russia in 2018. I expect that several tens of thousands of British people will visit Russia for the World Cup. I hope a lot of them will come here to Kazan. Um, I hope they'll have a great time here. Um, I hope we'll win the football here, um, but we'll see about that. Um, but uh, I, I look forward to seeing them here, and um, I hope that you do too. At least two people in my business delegation come from Tatarstan. Uh, they're Russian citizens. They work for British companies in the UK. What we're trying to do with this mission um, is to give some visibility, to give some impulse um, to the existing links between the UK and Tatarstan and try to develop more, to give some, uh, to give some energy um, to the things that we do um, in this part of the world. So in the next day, I will meet the Prime Minister. Um, I'll open a conference of Tatarstan and British business. We will open a film festival this evening at the Mir Cinema. It's not a Cold War spy thriller. Um, it is a romantic comedy. I'll visit Inopolis together with representatives of one of the world's top scientific journals, Nature, um, who are also doing a presentation now here at this, this university. Uh, and tomorrow I'll visit Tatneft and Kamaz um, to, uh, outside um, uh, Kazan. There will be other activities going on too. Um, a seminar on English law involving British and Russian lawyers. Why English law in Russia? Because Russian companies use English law to resolve commercial disputes um, and to protect their intellectual property. These things are absolutely fundamental to uh, the ability of companies to operate in the modern globalized world, the modern economy. Um, and we're very proud to work with our Russian colleagues um, on doing that um, through the legal sector in the UK. There'll be presentations on British education companies to your Ministry of Education, your schools and universities. There'll be meetings between British companies who are active in the business of sport. Uh, working with your Ministry of Sport, um, they will visit the Kazan Arena. That stadium, by the way, was built with the involvement of British architects, populace. So there's a link there uh, which will last beyond the 2018 World Cup. Um, that stadium also, of course, uh, folk, uh, hosted another of our great exports um, recently, Liverpool Football Club. There will also be meetings with a group of local travel agents to encourage tourism to the UK and the final uh, reading of the competition at Kroevrot, reading aloud Shakespeare. Like Tolstoy, one of the world's most important writers, somebody who influenced Russian literature and culture deeply, as he did many others, this year we are remembering the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. There are three areas where I'd like to see more cooperation and essentially the reasons why I've come here. Um, first of all, education and science. There are over 3,600 Russian students studying at UK universities. And I know that as part of Tatarstan's Algorish program of scholarships, your government sends students all over the world, including to the UK. 3,600 seems to me to be nowhere near enough. I would like to see more. I'd like to see British people coming to study in Russia, including here in Kazan. We are sending 30 students to the UK next year from Russia as part of our government scholarship program, the Chevening program, uh, to study for master's degrees, the next degree up from a first degree. We plan to increase the number of scholarships next year, and we would like to see more applications from Tatarstan, from here in Kazan. Um, there is information available. My colleagues over on this side of the room are happy to talk to you about it if that's something that interests you. What we are looking for are the leaders of tomorrow, the decision makers of tomorrow, who we will work with um, for the next 30, 40, 50 years. So please think about it. Your university already works with a wide range of universities in the UK. Um, including two of my former universities, Cambridge and the Open University. I know that other universities in Tatarstan are doing the same. 
Kazan Architectural University is running dual degree programs uh, with the University of East London. And researchers at Inopolis um, are working with researchers in Newcastle. We want to increase the number of those partnerships. Again, is why we've come here today. Um, the British Council plans to double the number of research partnerships it will sponsor, and I hope that your researchers will again apply, that you'll consider working with us in this area. We want to work with you to internationalize Russian education and science. Internationalization is a two-way street. I went to a university that has an enormous number of contacts around the world. I studied, this was 30 years ago, alongside European colleagues, American colleagues, Chinese colleagues. In those days, not many Russian. It was before 1991. Um, I learned a lot from that. I got a lot from it. Um, and so we are not doing this um, you know, simply because um, you know, we think it's good for you. We think it's good for us. Um, and that's why we want to develop this. The British Foreign Ministry um, has a, uh, a member of staff, a chief scientific advisor, Robin Grimes, someone I work very closely with, uh, who describes it this way. We need to work with you because you think differently from us, and that helps us to solve problems. Just an example of that, um, the UK wins a lot of Nobel Prizes. Uh, we won a few in the last round. Two of our most successful, our most well-known Nobel Prize winners in physics um, at Manchester in 2010, won a prize for the two-dimensional material graphene. I have no idea what that is. I'm sure you do. Uh, those two people are both Russian. They're Russian scientists working in the UK on an internationally important subject. The English language, of course, is um, part of our global unique selling point. It's, it's great for me that I can talk in, in English today and a lot of people understand me. Um, but as your government, as the Russian government seeks to internationalize your education system, a very important part of that um, is about uh, improving the visibility, the engagement of Russian scientists with the global scientific community. Um, so I've brought with me today the, uh, the, the globally important scientific journal, Nature, who are talking to their colleagues about how to achieve that, about how to ensure that Russian research, Russian science, has greater visibility on the international stage. And a lot of that is about publishing in the English language, I'm afraid. The second area is culture. One of the things that the British Council is doing jointly with the Russian government this year is holding years of language and literature. Um, ours in Russia, Russia's in the UK. As part of that year of language and literature, the most famous portrait of William Shakespeare, the only portrait that we know was painted from life, traveled from London to Moscow for most of this year. That is the second time in 400 years that painting has traveled outside England. We brought it here to Russia. In return, a portrait of your most famous alumnus, Tolstoy, was on exhibition in London for about six months. It was a fantastically successful exhibition. Thank you. That exchange wasn't a coincidence, it didn't just happen, it took a lot of work, um, and that work is important because the cooperation between British and Russian museums is based on mutuality and on respect. The most successful thing that I think we've done with Russia in recent years was the Cosmonauts exhibition in London. Um, it was the British Museum that staged an exhibition of the achievements of the Soviet and Russian space program you might ask, why, why did we do that? The answer is that if Russia wants to explain to the world what those achievements were about to the next generation of scientists, engineers, thinkers, London is a good place to do it. Um, and of course, it's important that each generation understands and interprets for itself what actually happened when Yuri Gagarin sat on top of a rocket and went into space. Of course, it was a triumph for the Soviet Union. It was the height of the Cold War. But it was also a triumph for humanity. It was the first human being to do that. that, that. And we are very proud that that exhibition took place in London with our cooperation. That same exhibition is now back in Moscow at Vedenka, if you want to go and see it. Staying with culture for a bit, the BBC, our national broadcaster, 
One of its biggest successes last year was an adaptation of War and Peace. I'm told that Sparebank, corporate university, uses that film to teach English. The person who wrote the script for it, based on Tolstoy's novel, um, Andrew Davies, will visit Moscow this year um, for the Moscow Book Fair. Away from high culture, um, we actually have on my delegation um, a, um, uh, an, a person from um, London Ethno Art Fest. Um, he organizes the annual festival of Sabatui in London. What we would like to do um, is to give more profile to explain to the people of London uh, what sort of city London is, why it's such a rich city, because of its openness to other people's cultures. It's a very, very important theme, um, particularly as we uh, change, as we decide what sort of relationship we want with our European and international partners once we leave the European Union. I think that suggests that culture is not static. It's something new and it's something creative and it's something that each generation has to work on for itself. Finally, business. Um, it's a difficult time. Um, the economy in Russia is um, in recession. There are, of course, sanctions, um, which um, I think we all know about. You might ask, why bring a business delegation? It's because almost all of our business links with Russia are not affected by sanctions and the job of my embassy, my job, is to promote those business links, both because they're important, they're about people making a living, about the future of individuals and families, but also because they create the links that will sustain us through the next generation. The UK is Russia's seventh largest investor. UK companies are still active in Russia. They're active here not just because it's a big market or because of oil and gas, but because of the quality of the workforce, the people, and the ideas that they produce. And that's something that we want to invest in, we want to uh, plan uh, for the long term. I was quite surprised this morning, for example, to see um, an electric charging point for electric cars um, when we visited um, uh, the Innovation Center. Uh, Shell, a British Dutch company, um, has just opened its first petrol, in Kazan, uh, petrol station in Kazan. That also is a charging point for electric cars. Ten years from now, that industry, the way we travel, will not look the same as the way it does now. Um, and it's very good that we're working with you now um, on the sorts of things that will change the world in the next ten years. Business is above all about ideas, and it's about allowing people to fulfill their potential to do things. For our relationship at a difficult time, the contacts that we make through business, like the contacts we make through education and through culture, are of absolutely critical importance, both for now and for the future. That brings me to my final point. I said to the rector earlier, that this is the most important meeting of my time in Kazan, my visit to Kazan. That's because this meeting is about the future and you are the future. All universities are ideas factories. They are the places where we create the links, we create the knowledge, we create the thinking, the relationships that will sustain us through the future. We've come here today to build on those links um, and to hear what you have to say. I'm going to stop talking at this point and throw the floor open to you. Please ask me anything you want. If I can't answer, I will say that I can't answer. The floor is yours. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, dear colleagues, we have a lot of students here in this hall, those who will shape our future and f future of our cooperation. And if you have any questions on any area, any sphere, please you may ask. Your the speaker should ask the questions in the mic. Um, it's really amazing that uh, today we are able to see you here and to have a meeting with you. And 
Uh, I'm a student of uh, University of International Relationships and uh, it's uh, a great uh, honor for us uh, to see you here, yes? And uh, uh, my question uh, is actually not about uh, the politics, but uh, is for you as uh, for a diplomat, for an ambassador who uh, put many years uh, to this work in the foreign policy. Um, um, uh, policy, yes, yeah. uh, I want uh, to know about your experience yeah. and uh, uh, through experience of your years of work in the foreign sure. policy, uh, the main rules uh, that you learned and uh, mm -hmm. your principles in this work, what it is, yeah. what is important uh, to, uh, in the career of a diplomat? Yeah. Thank you. That, that's a really, really good question. Uh, have, have a seat. Um, what I might also do um, is um, ask my colleague Vicente to say a few words. Um, uh, Vicente um, works for me in the embassy, um, and um, he is one of our young diplomats. Um, this is his first time out of London. I would embarrass him, I hope. Um, uh, but of course, the world may look that the answer to that question may look very different to Vicente than it looks for me. But I'll, I'll try to answer. Um, first of all, I'm a child of the Cold War. Um, I was born in 1963, um, so you know, not long after the Cuba Missile Crisis. Um, I finished university the second time um, in 1989. Um, that date is quite important um, because it tells you a lot about the world in which I started doing this job. Um, you know, 1989, of course, was when the communist regimes in Eastern Europe um, were, were disintegrating. Two years later, the Soviet Union dissolved itself. I grew up in the world of an east-west bloc. I grew up in an army town, uh, a military town in the east of England. You can imagine you know, what it was like. Well, perhaps you can't. I, I hope you can't, actually. Um, but that has been something that has formed the understanding of my generation. Um, and I joined the Foreign Office, I joined our diplomatic service in the year when all of those huge changes were taking place. Looking back 25, 26 years later, it's still the most important thing that happened in my lifetime, and it's still something that is working its way through in the international system. We are still dealing with the consequences of 1989-91. It will take us another generation to complete that work here in Russia, in the West, in the UK. You know, this, this, is, this, is a, this is the most important thing, I think, that happened since 1945 in the world. We all have different views on that, and that's right. It's an immensely complex area of, of um, uh, international relations. But you asked me what I have learned. My, my very first time out of London, a bit like Vicente's in Russia, was in Romania. 18 months after the end of the Ceausescu regime. So I had direct personal experience of what it was like for those people at that time to go through that, that experience. And I think the single most important conclusion that I drew from that is um, it's, it's the respect word. Um, you know, I did not grow up in that system. I didn't experience it. I cannot say what is right or wrong for the people who did um, or for their children. They have to decide that for themselves. We, of course, have views, we have interests, um, there are things we agree on, there are things we disagree on, but this job, the job that I do, is about trying to find solutions, not to make problems. And you will only find solutions if you treat your partners with respect, if you understand why the, they think the way they do, um, and if you're prepared to look for the areas of compromise the areas where you have to disagree, okay, you have to disagree. But the areas where you can work together, where your interests coincide, identify them and work on them relentlessly, endlessly. Vicente, how does it look 25 years on? I think 25 years on, the world has clearly changed a lot. Now diplomacy is so much more about Twitter, about Facebook, about the contact here. Yeah. Uh, but I think the fundamental principles that, that the ambassador refers to about understanding each other and respect hold to this very day. So just four or five years ago, I was probably sitting in a, a very similar hall to this in my university in Oxford, where I graduated, listening to lectures from people in my position. 
Uh, and I uh, applied to join the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I think like most people that apply to join, they don't really expect to get in. So before they apply, they don't spend much time thinking about what, what it really is to be a diplomat. Uh, and, but when I arrived and started in the Foreign Office, the first thing that I was told was that it's not a sin to listen, that it's okay to spend your time just understanding how the world really, really works. Because there's just such a difference between the academic kind of understanding the conceptual theories that in, I studied economics in my degree uh, and the reality of human interaction. And I think my journey as a young diplomat has been, first of all, to kind of broaden my understanding of, of how people really interact across different cultures, across, uh, across different histories, across different economies, which is my specialty, but also to try and understand how it is that, that I interact. I think it's as, as diplomats, we have to be really aware of ourselves and how we interact with people. And so I think that's the journey that, uh, that, that I'm on as a young diplomat, and I need to try and myself change and improve faster than the world can change around me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this full answer. Well, and your questions, colleagues, please. Uh, and I represent Kazan State University of Architecture and Construction. Uh, so you mentioned about exchange program for masters, mm -hmm. but uh, are there any opportunities for students who still do their bachelor degree to the exchange programs in Great Britain? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, what I recommend you do is um, speak to my colleagues um, afterwards, Anastasia uh, Parfenova standing over here. Um, on the whole, our government programs are targeted at master's students. What we are looking for there are people who have already decided what they want to do and are able to explain to us very convincingly um, why we should send them as one of a very small number of people um, to the UK. Uh, bear in mind the politics of this in the UK. Um, we do not pay for our own students to go to university. They pay their own fees, they pay their own living costs. So for, their to, for us to send foreign students at our cost to our universities, there has to be a very, very strong reason indeed. Um, so on the whole, first degrees, bachelor's degrees, we won't pay for. Um, uh, we can certainly give you information about um, how to access, how to get into UK universities um, at, at bachelor's level if somebody else is paying, but, but we won't. Thank you. Any other questions? All the information on the UK universities is available in our foreign department, department and that is why you, we have uh, dual diplom diploma programs, uh, and it is also uh, touch, it also uh, deals with the master's programs. Good afternoon. My name is Ala. I am the representative of Kazan Federal Universities, and it is a great honor for us to to be here today. And what uh, what changes do I observe in the society after Prime Minister's uh, new Prime Minister took her post office? And well, so we would be really pleased to hear what you think about that. I, I will attempt to answer that question. Um, I have to start by um, explaining a very important thing about the way our government works. Um, in 1997, um, I was the, the private secretary, the chef de cabinet for our Europe minister. Um, 1997 was the year of an election. We had a change of government. The, the government that was leaving office uh, wanted to leave the European Union. The government that was coming in was strongly pro-European Union. My job as a civil servant um, was to, uh, when the new minister came in, whoever it was, um, to say, this is what you want to achieve, here is how we can achieve it. So of course I have private views, I have a vote, of course I vote. Um, I even voted in the referendum on leaving the European Union. I have very strong personal views on that. But my job 
and the job of everyone, people like Vicente, like Anastasia, um, is to make happen, to deliver the policy of the government of the day. It's absolutely fundamental to how our civil service works. And the deal is, if you don't agree, leave. Um, so I have to say that because that's, that's fundamental to how our government works. So in a way, it doesn't matter um, what I think um, of um, either developments in the UK or the change of prime minister. My job is to work for the prime minister. As it happens, um, I know Theresa May very well because in my last job, I worked very closely with her on counter-terrorism subjects. Uh, she was our interior ministry minister. Um, I was in charge of counter-terrorism in the foreign office. It was quite a job, I have to say. Um, but I, I have got a very good idea of what interests her, um, what makes her tick. I'm, I'm not sure how you translate that into, into Russian. Um, but you know, what, what are the things that, um, that politically she is interested in? And I think possibly the most important thing um, for a foreign audience um, is to go back to why the British public voted to leave the European Union. Um, and Theresa May in Downing Street, um, the morning she became Prime Minister, her message to the public was, okay, I understand. The reason a lot of people voted to leave the European Union, she voted to stay, the reason a lot of people voted to leave is because people are not happy with the way Britain works at present. It doesn't work for everyone. And I think the central theme of her government, as she said, is a government that works for everyone. So not just the rich, not just the poor, not just people who support or are against the European Union, but everyone. Um, and that, I think that's the major change to focus on in British society this year. You know, we've gone from a situation where there was I would say, a, an educated consent, a, a consensus amongst the, politically, the political class that we wanted to stay in the European Union. We asked the voters, and the voters said, a small majority of voters said, no, we don't. No, we don't. Um, and as a government, we have to understand why, and we have to deal with the things that the public are telling us. D does that help? The other important thing, by the way, is she's a woman. The only, the, only the second time... Um, in our history that we have had a female Prime Minister. Again, that I think is telling us something about the way that our society is changing. May I ask another question? Thank you very much. Uh, when uh, the Prime Minister is a woman, what is her role in the, in the political arena? What is the women's role in, in, pol in politics? I mean, everyone will have their own opinion on this. And looking around the room, about half my audience is female, so I need to be a little careful <laughs> about what I say. Um, my, my own view on this um, is that the most important thing about having a female prime minister is that it's not actually special. It's not special. Um, women are capable of running a country like the United Kingdom. Um, we may well find a week from now that the United States has its first female president. Um, uh, the United States has had its first black president. Um, I think the, the most important thing for me here is that when the public are choosing their leader, they're choosing their leader because of what that person can do not because they are male or female or black or white or anything else. You know, th th those things don't matter. What matters is what you can do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so another question, please. Uh, a student of Kazan Federal, Federal University of International Relationships. I study linguistics and uh, I want to ask you if you think that it'll one day be easier for Russian students to get a British visa. To get a British visa? Yes. Uh, right, the visa question. Um, I hope that it isn't difficult now for Russian students to get a visa. Um, generally, the figures are that uh, th this may come as a surprise. Let, let me just ask you, what, what percentage of visa applicants do you think get their visa, just in general, the public? 
I think forty uh, percent. Any improvement on forty? Forty percent get the visa out of one hundred. Actually, it's ninety-six. Ninety-six percent of applicants for a British visa get their visa, um, and almost all of those who don't get their visa have not filled in the forms right. I think the key point with students, though, it's not getting the visa, it's getting the place at a university, and it's getting the finance uh, to support them. As I said in, in answer to an earlier question, as a government, we've taken a decision that we will not pay for our own students to go through university. So it follows from that that we will not pay for foreign students either. Um, and of course, the amounts of money involved are quite big. So you know, the, the first question is, get your place. The second question is, how are you going to pay for it? And the third question is, the visa. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, I'd like to join to what has sound in the ambassador's uh, answer. We haven't got any refusal for visa, both for students and our uh, lecturers. Then there was another question, please. Well, so don't sound that you are a student. We are all students of Kazan University. We are all the representatives of Kazan Federal University. Hello, and I'd like to uh, lower faculty. And my question is concerning sports. Tatarstan and the UK develop their relations in uh, uh, in sport as well, and we know that Kazan Arena uh, was uh, planned by designed by Kaz UK architecture. And will you uh, develop uh, sports and concerning uh, Olympiad and football and all the uh, scandals? Well, so does sport go out of politics? Will Tatarstan develop uh, relations in sports? Will UK aid to Tatarstan in the sports developing? Okay, um, sport links, um, the, the first question. Um, the, the most important thing on our horizon here um, is the World Cup. Um, one of the things that we learned from hosting the Olympics um, in the United Kingdom was that it's the most incredible engine, the most incredible motor um, for de developing sport in society and for developing sporting links and also business links um, around that. Um, the, uh, the Russian World Cup will be the first and last World Cup in Europe for a long time. Um, for Brazil, the World Cup in Brazil, tens of thousands of British fans traveled to Brazil. Brazil is a very, very long way from Britain. It's quite hard to get to. So I think I expect from that that a lot of British fans will come to Russia um, for the World Cup here. I hope to Kazan, um, if our teams play here. Um, and I hope that linked to that, we will be able to do some things uh, between sporting organizations at, at what we call the grassroots level. So people who you know, play sport for, for fun, really. It's a bit too early to give you the details of that because it's 2016, the World Cup is in 2018. But I have part of my team here today is focusing on this area. So looking at the, making the connections we need here in Kazan to ensure a successful World Cup. Um, your second question on scandals, I'm afraid I'm going to largely avoid this question. Um, you know, there's, there's not much I can usefully say on it that you don't already know. Um, you know, the, uh, the world's press is full of stories about corruption, about doping, and so on and so forth. The position of our government um, is that those scandals should be investigated and appropriate action taken, but it's not a question for us. It's a question for the sports bodies themselves. So I'm afraid I, I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, 
uh, what uh, companies do, they t take uh, oil and transport to the other place. But the energy of the oil is the accumulated energy of the sun. The energy of the sun is everywhere. It's just the question how long we charge batteries. Do you think uh, Russian and British scientists could uh, work on this problem together, on the alternative sources of energy? Yeah, I, I very much hope so. I'm going to ask Vicente to say the words about this because it's one of his specialist subjects. Um, but, um, of course, uh, one of the things that we have done as a government in recent years is to pass a law which forces our economy over time, over a long period of time, to decarbonize. So we have to move away from fossil fuels, oil and gas. That means moving to alternative sources of energy. And that also means working with anyone in the world, anyone in the world um, who is an effective, has technology, has knowledge, has ideas about how to do that. So it's wind, it's sun, it's nuclear, it's renewables, um, and um, you know, all of the associated questions. Um, and a, a company that you know, I used to work with quite closely 10 years ago, BP, British Petroleum, at one stage rebranded themselves, not very successfully, as Beyond Petroleum, um, because they knew that the future of their business was as an energy company, not as an oil and gas company, if they're thinking 50, 60 years out. They're still trying to get there. Vicente. Thank, thank you very, very much. I think one thing you can certainly say about alternative sources of energy is that momentum is, is really, really growing in developing their technology and in using them more and more. In the last few years, the cost of solar panels has dropped by around 80%, and very soon scientists expect that they will be able to compete without any subsidies with traditional forms of energy. Last week, the International Energy Agency released new results showing that renewables use across the world was growing much faster than we could have predicted even three or four years ago. So I think it's clear that sooner or later the world will gradually move towards a world where we're using alternative sources of energy. And as the ambassador says, we as the UK are extremely keen to work with, with every, every country, including Russia, in particular Russia, uh, on, on how we can tackle these challenges. Uh, later this month for the uh, Energy Saving and Energy Efficiency Forum in Moscow being organized by the Russian Ministry of Energy, we'll actually be hosting a visit of Sir David King, who is the Foreign Secretary, the, the British uh, Foreign Minister's Chief Advisor on Climate Change. And he'll be bringing a delegation of British companies and he'll be ho hosting seminars to discuss how we can tackle these issues, how we can develop better mechanisms for carbon pricing and essentially how we can work together to ch tackle these global challenges. So I certainly do think that uh, there'll be greater cooperation in the future and I'm very optimistic on that. Thank you. Just to reinforce Vicente's final point, this is not only a question for, uh, for engineers and technology uh, people. Uh, for the economists in the room, this is about you. It's about how you construct markets to, uh, you know, to deliver what the public needs, to deliver what the economy needs um, at a price that is affordable, a price that's reasonable. The only thing we should take into account is that all alternative sources of energy is just less than 10%, including atomic energy. Colleagues, we are short of time and his team will so and if you insist on your question please you are welcome please uh, well so it is last but not least and i think that we will continue our meetings with mr ambassador and um, thanks for the opportunity to ask a question so I have a very basic question. Yeah. See, taking into consideration all the political events that are happening right now, uh, how, much, how much is it likely the education UK market will change in the nearest future? Mm -hmm. I mean, like for the citizens of EU and for the Russian students as well. 
You mean particularly uh, Brexit, leaving yeah. the opinion? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I, I'll offer a largely personal view, um, and please respect this as a personal view. As you know, um, the, uh, the government was not expecting the voters to say, leave the European Union. Um, and of course, what we're now having to decide um, in the UK and then with our European partners is not only how do we leave the European Union, but what sort of relationship we have with it in the future. In my view, that second question is more important than the first question. Um, Germany, France, Italy, those countries are still our closest neighbors, our most important partners. Um, they're countries that we all know, we all travel to. My, the man who lives next to me in London, in the next house, is German. I hope he doesn't leave. You know, this, this is the, the reality that we're, we're facing. Um, on the point about education, um, there is a political debate in the UK um, about immigration. Um, immigration has links with education because if you attract in large numbers of foreign students, you have to take a decision about how many students you want and what you want them to do when they finish their education. Some of them we will want to stay, honestly. Um, in a modern economy, we depend on bringing in from outside new talent, new ideas. You know, that, that's why we have a dynamic economy. That's, always, that, that's been part of our model for centuries. But we also have to protect the interests and respect the views of those part of our population who find that a challenge. And that, that's one of the most difficult political questions we have to deal with. Um, my own view on this um, is that we have to stay open to the outside world. We want to stay outside, open to the outside world. We have a global economy, we have an open economy, and that means that we have an economy that is open to clever, bright people with ideas coming and going. So that's, that's what I, I, I hope and think will happen. One last point, um, and I think this is a good, uh, probably a good point to, to finish on. Um, whenever we talk about education, we tend to talk about schools and universities. That's only half of it. Um, I left university in 1990. Um, that tells you how old I am. Um, I went back to university 10 years later um, while working to study for an MBA because I needed to update and refresh my own skills and knowledge. Um, in my time in the Foreign Office, um, I mean, we are all required to spend, I, I, I forget the exact percentage, but something like, I think it's 5 to 10% of our time building skills for the future. Now, I'm over 50 years old, and I'm still building skills for the future. And the, the, the English words for this are lifelong learning. You never stop. You never stop learning formally or informally. Um, you should never stop listening. I think you know, my advice to you would be, do not think that your education finishes when you leave Kazan University. It doesn't. Your education starts when you leave university because what university has done is give you the tools that you need to continue that process. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have spared some more time. Thank you, dear Ambassador, for this meeting, for your open, uh, frank answers to the questions that sounded here and I'd like once again to invite you here and we would like to see you here uh, more often and to discuss uh, culture and education and uh, discuss the issues uh, and uh, we'll have some new ideas that will promote our uh, rapprochement. Thank you very much, colleagues.